who was Ralph Sonny Barger? You mentioned Sonny uh, a lot up well, until now. And- Sonny was the founding member, one of the founding members of the Oakland Hells Angels. That was in 1957. You know, it was San Bernardino, San Francisco, and then Oakland uh, became the third uh, Hells Angel charter. And uh, Sonny was a very uh, uh, powerful figure in the club. And, you know, you got to give him credit. Him and I uh, uh, had different leadership styles. And we didn't always agree, but I always respected him. Uh, but Sonny has to be attributed to organizing the club. The club was fractured a lot in the 60s. There was a lot of outlaw bootleg Hells Angel charters. There were several Hells Angel charters in Southern California uh, that weren't... Uh, uh, United. They were individual independent charters. And what Sonny did was he eliminated all those charters, uh, took the power base from San Bernardino and brought it up to Oakland. And uh, he became kind of the voice uh, and the face of the Hells Angels, if you will. You know, you got to give the guy credit. It's right. He just died here a year ago. He was 82, yeah. I believe. How old? 82. Wow. Yeah, he was wow. up there. Wow. Uh. So you and he ended up getting into, you guys were pretty, pretty close at a point. And then, then you became, I guess, based upon what you were saying earlier about him having had the bout with cancer and then kind of having to fall back and expecting to die, but then not dying. Um, and then, you know, now you're in position. And so you guys begin to have a problem. Right. Well, you know, I, I got to give the tenacity on that guy something else. Now, he goes to prison in uh, 2000. Uh, no, he goes to prison in the late, early 90s, I'm going to say. Returns five years later, end of, you know, the 90s. Goes back up to Oakland and things have changed. You know, there's a whole younger faction in the club now. You talked about... Uh, rejuvenating the club. I mentioned my boy and all the young people. And, you know, that resurgence with the younger members wasn't just happening in Ventura. It was happening in the Bay Area, uh, San Diego and whatnot. Sonny comes home and this is how I see it and saw it. He doesn't quite have the power he had. So what's he do? He packs up, goes to Arizona and uh, takes the Dirty Dozen, a club that's uh, controlled Arizona for 30 years, turns them into Hell's Angels and uh, starts fresh in uh, another state, you know, winds up putting a book out, writing a book, getting permission from the club to write a book, getting permission to do a movie. He's doing a lot of things uh, that he was having trouble uh, pushing through in California. He's getting what he wanted in uh, Arizona because he was the top dog over there. He could, you know, he could pretty much do what he wanted. But he uh, ultimately came back to Oakland, you know, he continued to battle cancer. And, you know, his first bout with cancer was in the early 80s. And, uh, you know, like I said, he died a year ago. Uh, you know, he succumbed to cancer finally. But I mean, you know, you talk about tenacity on somebody, he fought that disease on and off for, you know, since the 80s. But, uh, you know, him and I were very close at one time. And, uh, you know, I'm writing a new book uh, called Crossing the Rubicon. And it's about my relationship with him. And, you know, it was very close. Uh, I admired him, but I didn't always agree with him. And uh, I guess if you say I, I had a, uh, a fault, it was voicing my opinion when he thought I should have kept my mouth shut. And, uh, you know, I was very vocal. I didn't, uh, uh, I didn't hold back. You know, I, I did a lot of stuff uh, throughout the club, uh, you know, made a lot of trips to Europe. I went to Europe to end the war over there with the uh, banditos and the Hells Angels and the Scandinavian countries. Anybody, you can look up the Scandinavian bike wars. Uh, the Scandinavian government petitioned the United States government to allow uh, two uh, members of rival clubs to come to the United States so uh, we could negotiate a peace with them. Myself and George Weggers, who was the international leader of the banditos, met with them in Washington. Uh, it was Blondie from the Hells Angels and Jim from the Banditos. And, uh, you know, we negotiated a, a peace. There had been, I think, 
11 to 14 deaths, 97 wounded. I mean, it was a very serious war. They had a shootout in the international airport. They were shooting rockets into each other's clubhouses. And what you have to understand, like people say, well, there's no guns in Europe. You're correct. There are no guns in Europe. You just can't go in and buy guns like you can here in the United States. But they have something different than we have. They have local militias. Uh, on the outside of town, the local militias have armories where they keep the rocket launchers, the machine guns. And <laughs> what keeps the public out is a little padlock. So the two factions are going to these armories, knocking them open and, you know, walking away with uh, rocket launchers, uh, machine guns, uh, handguns. And they had a full-on war going there. You know, I know the banditos shot a rocket right into the Hells Angels clubhouse, killed two or three uh, Hells Angels, I think a civilian woman. Uh, hmm. So when the Scandinavian okay. government, these guys normally would never be able to be allowed to enter the United States. They're both felons. Bondi had murdered two guys and had just got out of prison, but he held a lot of sway in the Hells Angels uh, in Denmark. And, uh, you know, they petitioned, the Scandinavian government petitioned American government. They brought them over. We actually had a phone number that if any law enforcement interfered, we were to give them the number. They were going to call Washington, and Washington was going to tell them to stand down and let us do our job. Our job being uh, to uh, broke broke the peace. peace between the bandidos yeah. in uh, Denmark and the Hells Angels in Denmark. And ultimately, they did. And uh, do I think uh, uh, it was entirely uh, because George Weggers and I negotiated that? No, I don't. But I think we played a big hand in it, you know. Right. We were very adamant about, you know, getting this put behind us. I'd made several trips to Europe uh, to talk to everybody. And, uh, you know, when I first, the first time I went to Europe, I, I went to Amsterdam and uh, there had been a shootout in the airport. And, uh, you know, I went there and, and the Hells Angels basically told me to mind my own business, the Hells Angels in Europe. You know, they, they said... Uh, you know, we're going to kill every bandito in Europe. And I said, you're not going to kill every bandito <laughs> in Europe. I go, you know, you're, that's a pipe dream, man. And uh, if anybody has the opportunity, there's a, uh, a video out right now. It was from Denmark. I just did it uh, last year. It's the rise and fall of the Hells Angels in Denmark. It's a seven part uh six or seven uh, series episode on the Scandinavian bike war. It's probably one of the best uh, things I've seen in a long time. Not quite as good as my uh, podcast. <laughs> <But good. laughs> no, it's good. You know, it's I'll good. check that out. All right, man.